Good morning. I see that a few of us got the memo. We're springing forward this morning. Isn't that great? Hey, thanks so much. Hey, it's great to be in the house of the Lord because we have the opportunity to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it ain't getting better than that. Can I bet on that? Thanks be to God. Hey, it's so good to have everybody here. It's also good to have everybody tuned in to be a part of our live stream in this morning. And we're just um, thrilled to be able to be here in the house of the Lord to be able to worship Jesus Christ. So let's prepare our hearts for worship and let's draw attention to the screen. The top three things we have, what's going on in life for our church as we get ready to worship the King of Kings. Welcome, everybody. Hey, church family. We're so glad to have you worshiping with us this weekend. Here are this week's three key announcements. First, the March Women's Gathering will be on Thursday, March 16th from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Center with lunch to follow. The program is titled In Living Color, Colors of the Cross. And at this event, we will discuss the life and the ministry of Jesus as well as how we can exemplify His teachings in our own lives. Registration is required and costs $10. To register and to learn more about the lunch menu, please use the link in your weekly word email. Next, the New Covenant Youth Group is selling t-shirts to help with the cost of mission trip. I'm wearing one now. In the East Narthex, we will have small, medium, large, and extra large shirts available for purchase of $25. We can accept cash, card, or check. If you would like a smaller or larger size, please let the youth know who is selling the shirts and we will work to order the shirt for you. We appreciate your support of the New Covenant Youth Group. Lastly, the next installment of our health speaker series will be on Wednesday, March 22nd at 1 p.m. in the chapel. At this event, New Covenant's own social worker, Jackie Kuhn Demron, will share a presentation called Finding Hope When Your Dreams Are Shattered, The Journey of a Loved One with Dementia or Alzheimer's. The presentation will cover topics such as emotional stress, depression and loneliness, physical distress, and more. There is no fee or registration for this event. Now, let's get ready to worship our great God together.
one of my favorite hymns. Oh, I love to hear that. If you'd stand with me for our responsive call to worship this morning. Just as you are, God will receive. God will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because of God's promise, we believe. O Lamb of God, we come, we come. We come this third Sunday in our Lenten journey to offer our praise and thanksgiving. In today's message, we will be reminded that we gather to exalt God, which first requires that each of us come with true humility. <laughs> Lord our God, you yourself remind us that through your holy people, that all of our religious practices are not worth anything if we use them to bend you our way. God, may we come to you in humility and repentance, ready to encounter you in love and to turn your way. Accept us as your sons and daughters, together with Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord forever. Amen. Let us worship together today. join together as we continue in our worship this morning in declaring our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
seated if you would, please. Thank you. As we come together for our time of prayer this morning, if you would like to join Pastor Harold at the prayer rails, please come. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty and loving God, we are so grateful for your presence here today. May you move among us. May your spirit be felt. May we worship you with all that we have today and help us to carry that worship forward in a life that lives 
and loves to worship. May our days be filled with praising you for who you are and what you have done for all of us, for all people. We praise you for your son and we praise you for your spirit and we are grateful to be called your children. Remind us again when we interact with another person that they are truly a sibling in Christ. They are your, our brother or sister. May we recognize the Jesus in them and may it recognize the Jesus in us. Some days it's really hard to show Jesus to all people. Maybe there's something that is troubling us or a, or a um, situation in our home, a diagnosis or a financial worry that it's allowing us to block Jesus from being seen. I pray, God, that you will let us release those barriers and reach out to one another in God's love. And we pray for your love to come upon our brothers and sisters around the world, those that are under war and duress, those who have lost so much to earthquakes, God, you alone can soothe the hurts in our world. You alone can soothe the food insecurity, the homelessness. You alone are the one who can do all things. And we trust you and we love you today as we express our worship of how you come to us in our deepest, darkest times and restore and redeem and renew us. For that, we are grateful, God. As we go about our days, put people in our path that will be moved by your word, by your presence, by mostly your love. May we respond to your guidance, to your leading us, and may we respond positively, recognizing what you have called us to do. For this time of worship, God, keep our eyes and our minds and our hearts solely fixed on you and your goodness and your mercy. And as Pastor Harold brings us the word you have given him, will you fill him with your spirit? Will we see you at work? And may we leave here changed today to go out into the world and make disciples for the transformation of our world. We are so grateful for this place we call home that we can come together and get refueled for the week ahead. Give us that today, God. Show your power and your might in how we can respond to your word and to your presence. In all things, give us the recall to remember all that Jesus taught us and to remember how he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor Allen, for praying for us and praying over us this morning. Beautiful. So my little granddaughters come to visit um, us this weekend. We're going to Disney World tomorrow. And so um, anyway, so uh, we, she was with us uh, last night and Donna, my wife, came up and prayed. I'm over there and I said, Marley, when, when, when Donnie gets up to pray, you're going to go with me and we're going to go pray over there because I didn't want her running amok. And so, um, so we went over there and we prayed. And so I knelt down and we started praying. And then she whispered to me, she says, where's the quilt so I can tie the knot? She's only five. She gets it. So let me just tell you, those prayer quilts and the prayer shawls that we give out all over the world are a big deal. They make a big impression on people. It's, once again, it's a signal of the love that we have for people, the love that we have for people in our community and the state across the country and all over the world. So don't ever underestimate the power of prayer and the gift of those prayer gifts, uh, prayer uh, quilts and shawls. We're so grateful for that. Hey, listen, uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this, uh, this morning. And, I, you know, I always highlight different ministry. And this week, we're going to be highlighting um, our food pantry ministry through the Wildwood Food Pantry. We're so grateful for Don and Marlene Huggins, their passion and love for the food pantry. We always take a, a special food drive uh, in the spring, and we do one in the fall. Matter of fact, I think we did three last year because of the food shortage with, I mean, people in such great need. And we might do that again. Maybe we'll do another one this summer. We'll see how things go. But um, on the way out, you all probably will see on the front of your windshield, you'll see this bag. And so most of you know how this all kind of works. And we've been doing this for years and years and years. And so if you feel so led that we would love for you, they even give you the shopping list, um, go to Aldi or Publix or Winn-Dixie and then bring this back with the food in it on by, in the bag and then just leave it by your car. And then there'll be people prepared to go pick that up for us next week. So thank you so much for supporting that ministry along with all the other ministries that we have here at New Covenant. And I met this church, a place to call um, Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your tender mercy, your loving grace, and for once again calling us to the heart of worship. We have a song in our heart today, and we sing praises to you. We ask, oh God, your blessings upon um, the offerings of all these canned goods that are going to be collected this week, and all the food that's going to be put in these bags, and they're going to go out, and once again, it's just living into the vision you placed upon our hearts and the very fabric of who we are and our identity to be your hands, feet, and voice. And we ask, oh God, your blessings upon all the monetary offerings, the financial offerings, the tithes and offerings this morning that were given last night and this morning throughout the week. Use them for the advancement of your kingdom, Lord, and the advancement of your church. And we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's children said, amen. God bless you.
sermon series on the Gospel, Luke, Come Just As You Are, and um, today we're going to uh, focus on the parables this morning, but before we get started, I've I got to share this great, someone gave me a gift, my, my friends Gary and Debbie Search gave me a gift this week, I, I love this gift, it's a t-shirt, as obviously you could tell that, and, and this is what the t-shirt says, it's pastor warning, anything you say or do could be used in a sermon, I just thought that was actually pretty good. <laughs> I think this think that's a class. I just thought it was so good. I had to share that with everybody. Uh, thank you all. The searches are up here this morning. All right. So uh, we're going to start, and I, as I, I'm going to give you, we're going to talk about four uh, different parables this morning. And, um, and the reason why is because when you look at the Gospel of Luke, once again, and the Gospel of Luke is written in a way that um, is to lift up the lowly, right? And we find this right out of the gate, even when Mary talks about, she talks about being lifted up, being lifted up the lowly, and have God having mercy on them. And, and so we find this over and over again, almost every page throughout the whole Gospel of Luke, there's some, somebody's down, and the object of the of this whole gospel is to lift people up. And so we find the people who are on the outs, the people that are outcast. The, um, um, and so um, once again, we find this over and over again. And we also find it in the teachings of Jesus in the parables. So let me just read, um, let me, so we're gonna start with this parable. And this is the, the parable of um, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Okay, so this comes from the 18th chapter. Uh, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were, well, righteous and regarded others with contempt. He says, two uh, men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like all these other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like the tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, please have mercy, I'm a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and but all who help them themselves will be exalted. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, amen. So the title of my sermon today is Jesus, is Jesus' button pushing parables. Push a button. I, I, I actually bought this as a sermon illustration, I don't know, six or seven years ago. It, it was, uh, Staples used to do, they had a, uh, am, uh, they had a campaign for commercials and it was called the easy button and you could... That was easy, right? And, and so I have no idea why I brought this up today other than I wanted to get more money out of my sermon illustration. So anyway, I got two out of it. Now, actually, this is, there's something truth about that. It's because life was not easy in first century. I mean, this is part of the reason why Luke is written the way that it is. It's because people were, many people were beaten down. And once again, the ones who have been kind of beaten down by life, life was not easy, and they were on the outs, the outcasts, the outsiders. And once again, this is the reason why the Gospel of Luke is written a certain way. So um, when I thought about this theme about pushing a button, um, what's very interesting, I actually looked this up this week, kind of, um, I always kind of do my detective work, uh, and so I looked up the, the, the meaning of pushing someone's button. So pushing someone's button means to do something or say something that maybe, that causes someone to have a very strong kind of emotional reaction. It could be anger, irritated, annoyed. And what's very interesting is that uh, Jesus was actually pretty good at this. Now, he didn't do it intentionally to, you know, just provoke people, but uh, Jesus was always in the way that he lived his life, and especially the way he taught these parables, is he was, he was um, always trying to reveal the true nature of the kingdom of God. He was always trying to reveal the true nature of the heart of God. And a lot of times, the things that he did and the things that he said um, didn't line up the way that people had this image of what God was supposed to be like. Like, for example, um, uh, reje Jesus was reject rejecting his own hometown. And so what really pushed the people's button, um, Jesus said this. So 
Um, just before he starts his ministry, he goes in and um, he goes to his own hometown. He uh, opens up the scroll. He could have read anything, but this is what he said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim the reach of the captives, to recover the sight of the blind and to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And after they heard that, they wanted to take him off to the top of the cliff and they wanted to kill him. Now that pushed some people's buttons. Uh, Jesus down, um, you know, on this last week, you know, um, Jesus walks in, Palm Sunday, everything's great. They're hailing a Messiah, um, rides on the donkey, raving the palm branches. Things are looking pretty good for Jesus. And then the first day, right out of the gate, what does Jesus do? He goes in and he starts turning over the money, change, money changers' tables. That pushing people's buttons. Um, and so when Jesus would do things, like he was always eating with the sinners, um, hanging out with the outcasts. The Pharisees didn't like that. That pushed some people's buttons. Um, I always try to keep things current, um, kind of contemporary. I don't know if you all know this, but it's a really big deal. Um, the, 95th, the 95th Academy Awards are on tonight. And I don't know if you all know, but last year, someone pushed somebody's button. It, it, it was, you know, uh, Chris Rock, he's a comedian. He said something in this comedy act about Will Smith's wife. And Will Smith took some offense to it. And he went up and basically decked him. It was just, and this is all in front of like 20 million people. Okay. In the midst of all that. So that was one of those kind of button pushing moments. I, I, I thought it was just interesting how that whole, kind of, whole thing kind of played out. Um, as um, the whole thing was revealed. I, I thought it was also interesting that as I think about the Academy Awards, by the way, I don't think Will's showing up tonight. <laughs> it, is that um, there's a couple of movies um, that I actually, I don't, you know, most of them I have never heard of. Chances are you haven't heard of them either. Uh, but there are two that I actually, that have been nominated tonight that I actually went to see. One of them was called Maverick. Um, I saw that one with Top Gun. It was a play. It was a, a sequel to. And then, by the way, that movie made 1.5 billion dollars. I think it did pretty good. Okay. And, and the second one was Elvis. And I I went to see. I loved it. Matter of fact, um, um, Austin Butler is up for Academy Award. Matter of fact, here's a picture of Austin Butler playing Elvis. And matter of fact, can you put that next slide? And here's Austin. And can you? Wow, they look a little bit alike, don't they? Amazing. Matter of fact, they said that Austin, he's already won a Golden Globe. They're saying, you know what? Make sure you have your speech written because they think that he might win tonight. Now, what was interesting this last week as I was flipping through channels, I don't normally watch PBS, but PBS had a documentary on this week. And it was about Elvis. It was about Elvis's comeback. Now, I thought it was interesting because, see, um, at one point, Elvis was, um, you know, he was riding high in the 1950s and early part of the 60s, and he was making a lot of movies. And, um, and so uh, about, but there was about a time, about seven years in Elvis's career that he wasn't doing real well. Matter of fact, one of the producers had this great idea that wanted, and went to Elvis and said, um, uh, um, they had talked about doing some kind of show. This has been in 1968. And so um, Elvis asked this producer, he says, well, how do you think my career is actually going? And he looked at him, he says, Elvis, I think your career is in the toilet. Can you be a little bit more candid, right? And so they designed in 1968, they put this, he had this Elvis's comeback show. He came out in this black leather outfit and it was a Christmas special and he put him back on, he was nervous. He had been on the stage for seven years and once he got going, he did pretty good that night. And what I thought was really interesting is in the documentary, they were talking about how um, that uh, when he was, um, the movies that he was doing, they made a lot of money but they were in very good movies. And the reason why Elvis is, maybe his career is in the toilet is because, here's the interesting thing, when it, when it comes to great songs, great songs always tell a story. I mean, that's just the way it is. So what Elvis was doing in those movies, and the, by the way, here's the whole plot of the movies, right? So, and they, it was basically the same movie over and over again. He even said it. 
the reason why his career was in the toilet is because he kept saying, and so they would have a movie, it would be Elvis singing, Elvis meets a girl, the girl has a boyfriend, Elvis beats up the boyfriend, and then Elvis keeps singing, and he gets the girl. That was the whole movie. And it was over and over and over again. And they kept asking Elvis to sing these songs that were terrible. And he knew they were terrible. Everybody knew they were terrible, but the songs really didn't have any meaning. If you, write, if you want to write, have a good song, it tells a story. The greatest, so, the greatest songs ever written always tell a great story. So, you know, my detective work this week. I, I went and um, I thought, okay, who are, the great, who are considered 10 the greatest songwriters ever? This is according to the Rolling Stone. Stevie Wonder, Joni Mitchell, Paul Simon, Carol King, Mick Jagger, Smokey Robinson, Chuck Berry, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and Bob Dylan. Top 10. And then the greatest songs, um, I thought this was Aretha Franklin, Respect. Bob Dylan was number four, the Rolling Stone. And I looked on one list, and guess what? Elvis Presley's Jailhouse Rock was number nine. Then I started thinking, okay, one minute. What are the 10 greatest hymns ever written? Oh, wow. No, listen, here's the interesting thing. Once again, every great song has this great story. And I learned something from Sean Pollock several years ago, and I, it really made, and all of a sudden it just kind of made sense because I don't live in his world, I don't live in the musical world, I like singing, and I like enjoy, but I never had thought about it. He said, you know, Harold, the, the greatest hymns, and the greatest songs that are written from a spiritual standpoint always tell a great story, but they've got great theology. I never thought about that. So it's not just telling the story, but there's a deeper theological meaning to the hymn or the song that we're singing. So ever since then, when I'm singing songs, I'm always looking for great theology in the song. So here are the top 10 greatest hits. Number 10, blessed assurance. Number nine, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Number eight, all creatures of all God, uh, God and King. Number seven, be thou my vision. Number six, praise the Lord the Almighty. Number five, great is thy faithfulness. Number four, it is well with my soul, Horatio Spafford. Number three, holy, holy, holy. Number two, how great thou art. And number one, I'm not gonna tell you just yet. Hold on. <laughs> so Jesus was the greatest storyteller ever. I, I really believe that. He was brilliant, how he could just tell a story, drop a hat. And what's interesting um, this week, I, I read that. So Jesus did be telling these stories. Parables are always a, a story with a lesson behind it. They are intended to, ready? Teach us something about ourselves. Teach us something about our relationship with others. Teach us about God. Teach us about our relationship with God. Teach us about the meaning of life. So often Jesus used people on the out as examples in his story. By the way, there are 49 parables in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the Gospels. Um, out of those 49 parables, um, nine show up in all three. That's a big deal. Uh, the other th interesting thing is that Two that are unique, two are only unique in Mark, eight are only unique to Matthew, 16 are unique in Luke. Luke really liked the stories of Jesus, why we get them over and over again. And what I think is really interesting is that if you look at the Jesus, when Jesus was spinning his story, um, there is a kind of, a, once again, there's always kind of a twist to it. Jesus is always, they usually have these kind of characters in the story. There's there's kind kind of a comparison going on in the story. We, I mean, and and he there's like like the king of a god is like, well, the king of a god is like um, a guy who's got a cast net and he throws the cast net out and he goes and gets fish and then he brings the fish back and he sorts out the good fish from the bad fish. A king of a god is like you know like a like a shepherd and he's got sheep and he's got goats and he separates the sheep and the goats. Um, there's always this kind of comparison. The kingdom of God is like a guy, he's, well, our father's got two sons. Uh, the kingdom of God is like the person who goes and sows seeds. You know, and there's like, well, he's got four different soils. You got rocky soil, thorny soil, beaten down past soil. You got all these different soils. And then finally the soil gets on pay dirt. It's in good soil. 
And, and so when we look at these stories, it's just amazing how uh, Jesus tells these stories. So you have these characters in the story, and they're always, and, and so and it's interesting if you, I think that Jesus is trying to kind of, once again, sometimes Jesus would push people's buttons. So it's always maybe what, in our own unique way, if we want to be truthful or not, if you go back and read all 49 of the parables, there's something about all those parables that teach us something about ourselves. So we have to ask ourselves, you ready? Which one of the characters in the story am I? We have to be truthful about that. And then the other thing we have to be truthful about is that when I look at the different characters, where am I in this story and what is Jesus trying to teach me in this story? Hmm. What's also very interesting, if you look at the parables, all 49, there's usually there's the, you can't miss the details because the, the details usually come before the story. There's something that happens or Jesus is having some kind of conversation with somebody or is saying something that sets up the story. We find that. So what I think is really interesting, if you look, like I just read this one just a few minutes ago. So we find this parable, the first parable we'll talk about today, is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Okay, what's very interesting about that story is that, once again, Jesus is always eating with, the, well, the outcasts. The, the, and he would even eat with the tax collectors. By the way, the word companion, as I taught you all last week, the word com, which means met, with, and panis is the word in the Greek, which means bread. Jesus is always eating, eat, breaking bread with companions or people that he wasn't really supposed to be breaking bread with. And that always pushed the Pharisees' button. They didn't like that. And in this story, we find that Jesus, once again, he starts talking about a Pharisee and a tax collector. Let me tell you something. The tax collectors were hated. They hated the tax collectors. It's because they had sold their soul to the devil. That was the Roman kingdom. They didn't like that. So once again, they, they were the, the tax collectors. Were, but I thought this was a great quote. Great quote. Uh, my, my friend uh, Robert, who was a, a former, um, actually, he, was a, he spoke at Men's Breakfast this last week. And um, he was a, a doctor for 45 years, and then he went to his wife after retiring, and he says, honey, you know what? I, I think I want to become a senator. And he did. He became a senator in Nebraska for like six or six, eight years, I think. And so he told, told a story. It was an amazing story. And then guess what? After he retired, after he retired, he moved to the villages. Isn't that great? <laughs> And so I'm so grateful for Robert's testimony. So he gave his story about his life and his life journey, his connection with his children, and just a remarkable story. But he said something that really was powerful to me in his testimony. He says, you know, there were times in which that he was always, always, always trying to work for the people. I mean, that was why he felt like he was elected is for the people. He says, but sometimes politics would get in the way. And there were times in which they, they were, they would be some tension going on between maybe him and maybe another senator or maybe him and the governor. And the governor wanted to be, maybe vote a certain way on certain things, but he felt strongly that he would, didn't want to feel, we have vote the way. And so there was all, maybe sometimes there was some tension going on. So one day he decided to do this. He started praying for the ones that he had a lot of, maybe there was some dissension towards. And there would be many times he would wake up and he would pray for the governor. That sometimes this tension would be between him and the governor. And this is what he said that was very profound to me. He says, you know, it's hard to hate someone who you are praying for. Now that just kind of sunk in. I've been working on that this week. People that maybe I've had some kind of riff with in my life, so maybe somebody that I had some kind of tension in my life. I've been working really hard because, by the way, sometimes it's not that, was easy. Not that so easy. How are you doing with that? So, so Jesus has this great story, uh, the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. And so what's very interesting, once again, you got to look at the detail at the very beginning of the story. So J Jesus told this parable to certain people, certain people who were, had convinced themselves that they were righteous and they were looked upon other people 
like a bunch of losers. So the Pharisee in this story says, oh, oh, I thank God I'm not like that guy. Man. And yet what's interesting, the tide turns, and so as Jesus tells the story, the, fair, the, the tax collector who everybody hated, he ends up being the hero of the story. Can you imagine that? Because it says he is, he's at a distance. And he's humbled by God. Matter of fact, he's so low. I mean, the Pharisee puts himself way up high, I think, and I'm not everybody like this. But the low guy, who's the tax collector, he admits that he's, he's, so, he's a sinner. He's so, low, and he's so low, he can't even look up. That's how Jesus spins the story. And then you get to the very end of the story, and I love this. This is what we find over and over and over again in the teachings of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. We call it the great reversal. Jesus says, I tell you, this person went down to his home and justified rather than the Pharisee. All who lift themselves up will be brought low and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. Jesus. It's genius. So we find this pattern over and over and over again in these stories. And so by the way, we have to ask ourselves, ready? Jesus wants to ask ourselves, which person are we in the story? Am I the tax collector or I'm the sinner? And you know what's interesting? Maybe we're a little bit of both. So I, I love this part of the story. You know, once again, I think it's powerful because so often sometimes we find ourselves, well, sometimes we can be a little judgmental. I had this interesting conversation with my children. Um, uh, we were hiking in Boone, North Carolina, up in the mountains. Now, what's interesting when I'm hiking with my kids, and um, my friend Will is here too, um, he was with us on this particular day. We were hiking along. And um, <clears throat> what was interesting is that we, when we hike, we talk about lots of things. We talk about, we talk about, movies, we talk about books, we talk about philosophy, we talk about even religion, theology. They're all over the place as we're just hiking along. And what's very interesting one day, I asked my kids, now listen, you think about the kids, my generation. So my kids run from the early 30s down to the young 20s. So there's 10 years that Don and I had a lot of kids and we didn't sleep at all for a decade. Zero sleep for Harold and Don. Okay. And so what happened, I look at that generation, and so I asked my kids, I said, so why is it you think there are a lot of people who just don't go to church anymore? And we call these people nowadays, we call them the, the nuns, N -O -N -N. They, don't, they don't go to church, they got nothing. And the duns, the nuns and the duns, the duns who've like, maybe they came to church at one point, but they're done with church. They don't have anything to do with church. So I asked my kids, why do you think that is the case? And one of them picks out his phone. We actually had cell service and we stop. And he flips through his phone and he clicks the button. And he shows me this person who's this, well, fairly renowned, evidently pastor in America. And he's, he's preaching, but it's all about being so judgmental and condemning, and self-righteous. And then my son clicks off the phone, he says, that's the reason why, Dad. He says, in my generation, our generation, a lot of them are just done, and they aren't anything, is because they see what's going on in the life of the church so often, and they think, you know what, I don't really wanna be a part of that, because they see the judgmentalism. Wow, that was powerful to me. And so what Jesus says to us as Christians, as the believers in Jesus Christ, he says, listen, it's, it's not about this. Jesus, once again, over and over again, as he spins these stories, it's not about being judgmental towards other people. Jesus talks about loving even the tax collector. And by the way, he makes him a hero in the story. Hmm. Number two. There's a story about what happened. We find it in the 16th chapter of the Gospel, Luke. And, and it's a story of um, the rich guy and Lazarus. I love this story. 
And so, uh, once again, you got to look at the story before the story. The story before the story is that Jesus sets the story up, and he talks about, hey, listen, you, you, can't, um, you can't worship God and money. It doesn't work. You got to have, you know, it just doesn't, it, it, you can't be focused and put all your attention on one and the other. It just, and so this is what's interesting is that when Jesus sets this story up about G, uh, the, the rich guy and, the, and, and, the, and Lazarus, um, he calls the Pharisees, once again, Jesus is always pushing somebody's button. He calls the Pharisees money lovers. That brought him some brownie points, didn't it? Money lovers. He called them money lovers. So he says, and in the midst of this story, he sets us up and he calls the Pharisees money lovers. And then he tells a story about the rich guy and Lazarus. Now the rich guy, which I know you all know the story. You can go back and read it today. So there's this rich guy. He's got this big, beautiful palace. And he's going in. And so and he was living a beautiful life. And then what happens is there's this poor guy by the name of Lazarus. Which, by the way, what's interesting, this is the only parable out of the 49 that Jesus names a character in his parable. And he named him Lazarus. And the word Lazarus literally means God has helped. And the reason why I think Jesus named this particular character Lazarus is because the rich guy isn't helping him. So somebody's got to help him. Genius on genius. Jesus. Uh, and so, so what, as he spins this story, the rich guy goes in his house and, and there, there's this poor guy, poor named Lazarus. Nobody's helping him. And he's pathetic. It's just pathetic. It's just awful. I mean, he's so pathetic. As Jesus spins his story, he's so pathetic that the, the dogs are licking the guy's wounds. And that's pretty low, right? And what's very interesting about this story is that over and over again, because the guy is sitting on this front doorstep, he has to either step over him or step around him. And he does nothing. To help him. But his name is Lazarus, which means God will help. Okay. And once again, we call this great reversal. They both die, Jesus tells the story. The rich guy and Lazarus. And guess what happens? Lazarus gets going to, he goes to heaven. And things don't go so well for the rich guy. And you have this great, once again, contrast between these two characters, isn't it? It's just genius. So we have to ask ourselves once again, where am I in this story? Am I Lazarus? Or am I the rich guy? And we look at this story, and once again, I think it's so powerful. We kind of unravel it and kind of look at it. I mean, God is really wants to, he, I think this is powerful because I think part of what Jesus is saying, listen, you know what? Life is not always fair. We get that. And by the way, life isn't always, that was easy. it's not always easy. But what, I think what Jesus is saying, listen, if I'm a, if I'm a person that's listening to this and I'm like a lowly person, then I, then I think, well, you know what? Life is not fair, but someday there's going to be hope for me. And maybe I don't get it in this life, but I'm going to get it in the next life. And I think that's part of the truth of the victory we find in the story. Third parable. We find this story that um, it's, it, it's very interesting and it's, because th I had never thought about this, but this story actually connects with this, the story I just talked about Lazarus and, um, and the rich guy. And here's the twist to it. It's a good, good Samaritan story. By the way, I think the two of the greatest stories ever told, we find the Gospel of Luke. Um, this is one of them, the good Samaritan story. And so what's very interesting, you're right, I mean, the, the connection. I have never thought about this, but so the Good Samaritan story, so you got this guy, he's got these, um, cat, cat, these bandits beat the guy up, they throw him in the ditch, and then, um, and then he's left to die, and then, um, and then all of a sudden there's a Levite who's a holy person, he, well, wait a minute, he doesn't actually step on him, 
um, and he doesn't step over him, but he steps around him. Then the priest comes by and he sees the dead guy lying, the guy's dying in the ditch. He doesn't step on him. He doesn't step over him, but he steps around him. And then Jesus, once again, genius, makes the Samaritan, by the way, they were hated the Samaritans. As a matter of fact, they're the low, the low. They were the Amharits. They were originally the Amharits, the people of the land that the Jewish people hated. Oh, they despise him. I mean, they're right up there with the uh, tax collectors. Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero in the story. You know what's interesting about the two stories about the rich man and Lazarus and the good Samaritan story is in both stories, people are walking either over the down, walking, stepping on the down of the outcasts or walking around them in both stories. Amazing. We look at the Good Samaritan story and say, where am I in that story? Last story. By the way, I think this is the greatest story ever told. It's the prodigal son story. I got chills just thinking about it. And I have preached on this probably 20 times. What a great story. You got this once again, you got the cast of characters, right? You got God, or you, excuse me, you got the father, you got these two sons. And so how does Jesus set this whole thing up, right? You've got, you have to kind of look at this and go, okay, all right. So you got this one rebel son who goes to his dad. And, you know, the Pharisees and tax collectors, they're, they're all listening to this story, right? And so when the, Jesus unravels this story, so you got this rebel son, and he does the whole, he does the outline. He goes to his dad and asks him for his what? Fair share of the inheritance. And the Pharisees are saying to the, oh, I, can, I can already hear him. Don't do it. Dad, don't give him the money. Bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. What's the father do? Gives him the money. And so we know that the, by the word prodigal means wasteful. So he goes off and he sits, spends all his money on wine, women, song, loses everything. And then we, once again, wait a minute, what is, what's the master theme that we find in the gospel loop? It's about low. How low can you go? And this story, Jesus makes it as low. This kid is hit rock bottom. He's feeding the pigs. Now, if you're an Orthodox Jewish person, that is the worst of the worst of the worst. You've hit rock bottom. Jesus puts that detail in the story. And so he finally says, the kid finally comes to his senses. I'll go back to my dad. I'll ask for forgiveness. Maybe he'll take me on as a hired hand, but I've already kind of blown my whole son thing. So he finds himself and he goes back to his dad. We all know the story. And what's amazing about the story is he goes back to his dad. The first line that Jesus put in this, he says, and the father saw him and had compassion for him and he ran to him. Wow. He hugged him, kissed him, embraced him. That's amazing. And then we find, and you think, okay, and then he winds up killing the fatted calf, and they're going to have a big party. By the way, this story is set up by, once you get the lost coin, um, you get the lost sheep, and then you got the lost son. So Jesus sets the whole thing up. And then you get to the very end, and you think, okay, end of story. No, 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 no. Jesus isn't done. You got the goody two-shoes son. By the way, you got to ask yourself, where are you in the story? And the goody two-shoes son has done everything right. He's done exactly what his dad has always done, asked him. And, and so he goes, and so he goes to, and his father goes to him and says, son, come on in. You got to go to the party. Your brothers come home. We're going to have a big party night. And he says, I ain't going. There's no way in heck I'm going to that, meeting, that party, dad. I can't believe that you would do this. And by the way, you didn't, get, didn't do squat for me. Hmm. And then there's that line. But your brother was lost, but now he's been found. 
And then Jesus leaves it open-ended. Genius in Jesus. We never know if the elder son went into the house or not. We have to ask ourselves, where am I in this story? Am I the prodigal? Am I the elder son? Hmm. You know, I, I think that when we come to church, I, I try to come to church with a song in my heart. I love, I love my, the words from my friend, Velta Kelly. Velta was at my other church. She's from Jamaica, and she'd come to me. She never called me Harold. She didn't call me Pastor Harold. She always called me Rev. Hey, Rev. And she would always say to me, and I love, she loved music, and she loved being in the choir, and she would say, you know, Pastor, she would say, Rev, I, I, just went, I, I got a song in my heart. We've, come a, we've got a song in our heart. When we come and talk about and we pray and we worship Jesus, we've got a song in our heart. I love it. never forgot that song in our heart. By the way, the greatest songs always have great theology and they always got, tell a great story. The number one song in history of great songs, Amazing Grace. You knew that. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, and saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now been found. Was blind, but now I see. That was easy. <laughs> so the question I have for us as we part today, do we have the song? of Jesus Christ and his amazing grace in our hearts. Do we still continue to sing that song as we go out into the world and to be his hands and his feet and his voice? So I, I, I got, well, here's my last little thought. I got a card this week. I got a card. This is a keeper. <laughs> Several months ago, um, we sent prayer shawls to Ubaldi, Texas, after all those kids were murdered. I got a thank you card. You guys got a thank you card from Ubaldi, Texas. We're sending them prayer shawls. Dear New Covenant, United Methodist Church, thank you for your sympathy and your kindness. Our district deeply appreciates the prayer shawls and Bibles for our families, your expression of love and support during the difficult times. <sighs> Brings us comfort and warms our hearts. Please, 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 Keep our families and community and our staff and your thoughts and your prayers. The Uvalde School Board. Amen. Let's stand.
God's grace, God's peace, God's unconditional love, hope, and mercy go with us now and evermore as we go out and be the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus Christ. Can I get amen on that? God bless you and you'll have a wonderful day. Thanks for coming to worship.